Holy Gospel according to Luke, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he, Jesus, stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wild. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back to, into the abyss. Now there on the hillside was a large herd of swine, and they were feeding. And the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herders saw what had happened, they ran off and told in, in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them, how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people surrounding the country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the Holy Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Christ. You may be seated. It's an honor to be here with you, the people of Zion Lutheran Church. In fact, my son's name is Zion, so this has a, a special place in my heart. As um, Eileen mentioned earlier, my name is Jennifer Roberts, and I'm a senior seminarian at LTSS. I'm originally from Knoxville, Tennessee, but now having lived here um, in Columbia, the Columbia area for three years, it's starting to feel much more like home. And I'm so grateful for you opening up your doors and hearts to me today. And if you don't mind, please pray with me. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Grant that what we confess with our lips we may believe in our hearts. And what we believe in our hearts, we may show forth in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. I've always heard that Southern Baptists make the best Lutherans. And I don't know if anybody else here would agree with that. But I grew up a Southern Baptist, and I think it's true. <laughs> So growing up in the South and as a Southern Baptist, there was never a time when I wasn't in church. On Sunday mornings and evenings, on Wednesdays, the church has always played a central role in my life. And growing up, my mom used to tell me how much I loved Bible stories, and she would even tell me that my Sunday school teacher, Miss Barbara, loved to tell me Bible stories because, because the more details she gave, the bigger my eyes got. And it made her laugh. And I did love hearing those stories. But then there were other stories. Stories like today's gospel. And growing up, several of my pastors loved to tell them in great detail. And I'm quite certain my eyes grew even bigger when they gave the details of these stories. And when I would lay in bed at night and think about them, they painted the shadows on my wall from the trees outside. And every creak of the hardwood floor made me pull my quilt just a little further up my nose. 
they brought nothing but fear. And if I'm being honest, they still do. Luke, Luke weaves a gruesome tale of a tortured soul who, by Jewish standards, is triply unclean. He's possessed by demons. He lives among unclean tombs. And he lives in a land where there are hordes of pigs and demons. This man has not only been tortured by the demons that possess him, but by his own community, who've often tried to bind him up with chains and restraints. The picture this paints in my mind comes with its own viewer discretion advised label. Jesus has just traversed the chaotic waters of the sea and his disciples and he land on this Gentile territory. And as soon as the demonic presence sees Jesus approaching, they throw the man to the ground, begging him not to be tormented. Because even the demonic things that hold us down recognize the power and life-giving grace that Jesus offers. But then Jesus gets personal. What is your name? See, it's almost as if Jesus knew that when things get ugly or out of control or scary and dark, that getting personal brings about recognition, change, and healing. For the demon-possessed man, part of the healing comes when Jesus agrees that the demonic forces can enter a herd of pigs and they eventually run off the cliff into the sea that Jesus has already overcome. And while physical healing for him is significant, we know that God has formed us to be much more complex people. This man has been emotionally and spiritually tortured and abandoned by his community. So he's not yet completely healed. In fact, the whole community needs to be healed. See, nearby some swine herders had seen what had happened and ran to town to tell what had happened. People followed them back and found Jesus, the one who he has healed, and they're afraid. Why do you think they were afraid? The very thing they've been trying to do to control this man and his demons, Jesus has done and done it successfully. I wonder what made them so fearful. Do you think it's because now they're the ones out of control? Do you think they fear Jesus because they recognize there are some things that he can do that despite their best efforts, they've never been able to accomplish. In his book, Breathing Under Water, Spirituality in the Twelve Steps, Father Richard Rohr points out that many of the trapped individuals in our midst are, share very similar parallels with institutions like the church, our community and nation. And perhaps a more faithful way to look at sin is through terms of addiction. Sin is a disease. A disease that we are captive to and cannot free ourselves from. In fact, research tells us that those who face addiction, trauma, or other emotionally or physical demanding conditions need two things to move toward healing. Faith and community. And this man in today's gospel had been deprived of both. See, this tortured man was a picture of the community itself, bound by the demonic notion that they didn't need anyone but themselves, even Jesus. Have we become a people that feels that we do not need others and in fact prefer to go at it alone? Because we've fallen victim to the demonic voice that tells us we can control the things that bind us, hold us down, control us, torture us. Dare I say, have we become a people who no longer need Jesus? Financial difficulties? Nobody needs to know. Facing divorce? We'll just work it out amongst ourselves. Broken relationships? If I put on a smile, 
Nobody will even know. Not sure who God is? I have my health and home. What more do I need? But beloved, those are not true. Because from the very beginning, God has created us for relationship, both with God and one another. All we have to do is look at the sacraments to remember this. In baptism, not only are we surrounded by family and our church family who promises to teach us the faith, but we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses who've been here before. At the table, we drink from the same cup, eat the same bread from the same body graciously given to us from our Lord Jesus Christ. Our freedom, our lives, our salvation are all bound together by one faith, one Lord, and one baptism. We cannot face any of our demons alone, and we can certainly not face them without Jesus. Even the most outcast, tortured individuals among us matter, and our communities are not complete without them, without their gifts, without their stories, without their presence. See, after being healed, the man wants to go with Jesus. Whether it's out of gratitude or to get away from the community, we don't know. But he wants to leave. But Jesus knows that sometimes our best teachers, the best preachers, the ones who can show us the way, most certainly, are the ones who've been to hell and back. This man who has been dismissed by his community will be the one that brings them the gospel. Perhaps today you sit here among your Christian family, but you feel different. You feel like people wouldn't understand where you've been, what you've been tortured by, what has possessed you. The tombs of loss, grief, disease, and solitude are familiar, and shadowy nights and quilts up to your nose are the only places where you feel like you can stay safe. Beloved, God can and will use your story to bring healing to others. It may be scary. You may feel afraid, ashamed, or adamant. But Jesus knows your name and your struggle. God needs you. The church needs you. Your neighbor needs you. Because when you share your story, it reminds me and all of us how much Jesus has, is, and will continue to do. And that is truly good news. Amen.